a valley just like many other valleys. A market just like many other markets. But this is Vietnam, and this market and this valley is that of Dien Bien Phu, where in May 1954, France suffered one of the worst defeats in her history. Certainly one to rank with Waterloo, and Sedan, and Agincourt. It was a defeat, too, that had dramatic effects around the world, not least in the West. Today, Dien Bien Phu is at peace, though here and there, uniforms still intrude. Every bump in the valley was fortified and fought over most bloodily. The agony of Dien Bien Phu, some called it. Memorials to the dead now crown many of the small hills. Decades later, rusting remnants of the epic struggle are still being dug up. Most of the fortifications in the valley have long since been cleared away, save this, the underground headquarters of the French commander, a macabre monument to such a miserable debacle. For 56 days and 56 nights, the French at Dien Bien Phu were besieged. Hell in a very small place was how one described it. There have, of course, been longer sieges this century. United States troops held Bataan for 66 days, while British and Commonwealth forces held Tobruk for 241 days. But what was different about Dien Bien Phu was that, like Midway and Stalingrad and the First Battle of the Marne, it was one of the most decisive battles this century. And it was the French defeat at Dien Bien Phu that ushered in the United States' involvement in Vietnam with all that that entailed. It will be a war between an elephant and a tiger. If the tiger stands still, the elephant will crush him but the tiger will never stand still. He will leap upon the elephant's back, ripping out huge chunks of flesh, and then will disappear again into the dark jungle, and slowly the elephant will bleed to death. That will be the war in Indochina. Thus spoke Ho Chi Minh in 1946. His elephant then in Vietnam was the French, though his remark was to be just as apt a decade or so later when his opponent was the United States. The West first became interested in Vietnam 300 years ago when French Jesuits established missions there. And it was the persecution of the Vietnamese Catholics by their rulers last century that provided the pretext for France to occupy Indochina. 7,000 miles distant from Paris, Indochina, and Vietnam in particular with its rice and rubber and opium, soon became the jewel of France's empire. Nor did the Vietnamese give the French much trouble. But Hitler's defeat of France in 1940 changed all that. Japan had already occupied much of Vietnam's neighbor to the north, China, and that same year forced the French to allow Japanese troops to enter the country. In July 1941, just five months before Pearl Harbor, Vietnam was integrated into the Japanese military system, though French civilians continued to administer it right up until the closing weeks of the war when fearing an Allied invasion, the Japanese imprisoned them. This was a body blow to the French, because it not only showed their weakness, and hence encouraged nationalism, but also, with the Japanese defeat in August 1945, created a political vacuum in Vietnam, which Ho Chi Minh's Viet Minh promptly filled. Viet Minh, which is a contraction of a longer Vietnamese word, meaning League for the Independence of Vietnam, had been founded by Ho in 1941. Now he took advantage of the confusion following the Japanese surrender to declare Vietnam's independence and to establish a government of sorts in the north based on Hanoi. 
It was some 10 days afterwards that the first British troops arrived in southern Vietnam to disarm the Japanese and to free the French. Though once freed, the French gave the Viet Minh short shrift, especially around Saigon. But Ho was having better luck in the north, where the taking of the Japanese surrender had been left to Chinese troops from across the border. It was largely to get those Chinese to leave that in March 1946, France recognized Ho Chi Minh's regime. More and more French troops poured in as talks dragged on to flesh out that recognition. But before the end of the year, France and the Viet Minh were at war. A war triggered by a relatively minor incident over customs inspection in Hanoi's port of Haiphong. Ho fled to the mountains near the Chinese border, where he remained for the next eight years. Eight years of up and down struggle, as first the French and then the Viet Minh seemed to be gaining the upper hand. Eight years that cost the lives of nearly 100,000 Frenchmen and many times that number of Vietnamese. Time and time again, politicians in Paris with one voice implored their generals to defeat the communists in Indochina for the glory of France, and with another found excuses for not sending them enough troops to win the war. French pride had been deeply wounded by their defeat in 1940, and they were the most reluctant of the imperial powers to grant independence to their colonies. Ho Chi Minh would have been ready for the same friendly association, continuing association between an independent Vietnam and France as India and Pakistan and Ceylon were already establishing with Britain after they had become independent. But the French did not believe that their overseas colonies should become completely independent nations. They thought they should remain a part of what they called the French Union, and that these overseas lands and their peoples were a part of France and the French, overseas France. They would, of course, enjoy a lot of internal self-government in their own affairs, but power would rest with the central government of the Union in Paris, which would control foreign policy and defence policy and certain economic policies and so on. The French wouldn't give way, and so war was inevitable. And a lot of the Vietnamese who had supported the French went over to Ho Chi Minh's side. The French, by and large, were able to maintain their hold on the major towns and for the most part to control the roads too. But the country areas were a different matter and were mainly the Viet Minh's province. However hard the French tried, they failed to clear them out. When French troops moved into one country area, the Viet Minh simply faded away to reappear as soon as the French had left, a pattern that became all too familiar to American troops 20 years later. Except on one or two rare occasions when they received a bloody nose that seemed to prove the rightness of their strategy, the Viet Minh avoided set-piece battles which infuriated the French generals. By the spring of 1953, the Viet Minh controlled nearly three quarters of the country. They invaded French Laos, which set in train yet another political crisis in Paris. This was the period when the French changed their governments as often as others changed their clothes. Public opinion in France had increasingly become war-weary and more and more voices were being raised in favour of a settlement that would bring the boys home. The crisis led to a change of military leadership. General Henri Navarre became the new French commander-in-chief in Indochina. His orders were to save Laos and to prepare the way militarily for eventual negotiation with Ho Chi Minh. The ending of the Korean War that summer meant that Ho could expect even more military aid from the Chinese and Russians than he'd been getting so far. For the French, it became imperative to clip Ho's wings as soon as possible. And this could only be done by tempting the Viet Minh into the open for a set-piece battle where, so the French thought, their superiority in firepower on the ground and in the air would win them the day. The place Navarre chose for his confrontation 
was this lush valley surrounded by high, heavily wooded hills in the northwest corner of Vietnam, a mere eight miles from Laos and 50 from China. But more importantly for the outcome of the battle, it was nearly 200 miles from the main French air base at Hanoi. Dien Bien Phu, the Vietnamese called it, seat of the border county administrative center is the prosaic English translation. Its lushness is due to its high annual rainfall. More than 60 inches fall here during the six months long monsoon season of March to August when clouds cover the valley for most of the day and low level flying, if not out of the question, is extremely uncertain as the French army weather people well knew. Needless to say, it was in the dry season that the French paratroops dropped on Dien Bien Phu. Friday, November the 20th, 1953, to be precise. With two batteries of airborne artillery and a company of heavy mortars, some 1,800 of them fell from the skies that day over the bewildered inhabitants of the valley. They were among the best of the French units in Vietnam and had fought in every major battle here so far. The French had, of course, occupied Dien Bien Phu before, but had been forced out the year previously. At the time, its loss had been dismissed as of no strategic significance, and the valley described as a mere inconsequential hole in the ground. Not all of Navarre's colleagues agreed with his decision to reoccupy Dien Bien Phu, and when the French government heard about it, they sent an admiral from Paris to try to dissuade him. The emissary presented himself in Lavar's office at the very moment the paratroops were dropping on Dien Bien Phu. The drop had nearly been called off at the last minute because of possible bad weather and a late intelligence discovery that the valley was defended by a few hundred Viet Minh regulars armed with mortars and machine guns. Viet Minh mortars and machine guns that caused the casualties among the French and kept the helicopter ambulances busy. By dusk, though, the Viet Minh had been cleared from the valley and time could be spared to bury the dead. Eleven on the French side and nearly a hundred Viet Minh that first day, the forerunners, alas, of some 20,000 who were to be laid to rest at Dien Bien Phu before the battle was over. The French generals were pleased with their first day and felt they could confidently plan for the morrow when another 650 men were to be dropped. 